New York, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Spark Summit East. Brought to you by Spark Summit. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to Midtown Manhattan, everybody. This is the Cube. We're live here at. Spark Summit East. And you know, one of the things that we like to do for our community is when we come to these events, we like to do little events within the events, and we'd love to have the panel of, of what we call doers. You know, some people call them end users or users, or I've often called them practitioners, but they're really doers, people trying to take technology, apply it to really solve a business problem or build out a business capability. So we have a, a panel of doers along with our own George Gilbert here. I want to introduce them and then we're going to get into sort of how they're utilizing Spark, leveraging big data to solve business problems. So let me start with uh, Tamara Hassan, who's the CTO of White Ops, a New York-based company focused on info security. Welcome, Hassan, thanks for taking the time to come to theCUBE. Uh, we just heard from George Gilbert. George, great job on the uh, big data forecast, thank you. And uh, Beth Logan, Boston-based data zoo, uh, very cool analytics company uh, that I've known actually for quite some time, followed you a little bit. Patriots fan? All right, good. We like to see it. Sadly. And then, <laughs> sadly, hey, it's not so bad. Life could be worse. Yeah. And then uh, Danny Rogers is the CEO of Terbium Labs, also an info security uh, company based out of Baltimore, right? So, folks, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, welcome. So, Tamara, let me start with you. We'll just go sort of my left to, to right. Uh, tell us a little bit more about White Ops, you know, the problems that you're solving, and sort of where big data and analytics fits in. Sure, yeah. So, we, um, we focus on a very specific slice of cybersecurity, mainly bot detection. So our, our goal is to verify that there is a human on the other end of the screen uh, every time the page loads. Uh, a variety of use cases for us, one of the larger ones is ad security, uh, where there's at least um, an estimated $7 billion lost annually to US advertisers. So, um, uh, so, so we collect a lot of data to do that. Our, our, core um, component of our capability, our, our product is called bot prints. They're essentially algorithms of detection. Uh, so, so we fingerprint automation and remote control or signals of automation or remote control. So we're, we're constantly developing these algorithms and they run on um, rather large data sets, arbitrarily large data sets uh, in stream and in batch. Okay, Beth, the director of optimization, so you're doing a lot, so obviously all that talk this morning about optimization was, I'm sure, interesting to you, but you guys, you know, have been in this business for a while now. I think you told me you guys, you've been with the company seven years. Seven years. So sort of before the big data meme even started. So talk a little bit about that journey and what you guys do. All right, so DataZoo's business is to provide great marketing, a uh, marketing cloud for our customers to, uh, optimize their ad spend, and this is across display media, mobile, video, the whole thing. And at the heart of the thing, we're buying media in real time on different ad exchanges. So my team works on the product that is optimizing that media buy. So again, we have lots of data, lots of previously shown ads, and we know whether or not the people converted, whether they clicked, what they did. And so we have tons of data to process. And we started with a Hadoop-based homegrown system so lately we've been transitioning to Spark because it's providing much more flexibility for us. Okay. And, then, and then Danny, give us a little elevator on uh, Terbium Labs, if you would, please. Absolutely, yeah. So Terbium Labs, we, are, uh, we run a system called Matchlight, which is the world's first fully private, fully automated data intelligence system uh, focused on searching the internet on behalf of our clients for uh, elements of their data leaked to places such as the dark web, uh, other places that are that, that they would not want to see their data leaked. So, um, you know, we are very much a, a big data company uh, applied to security um, and 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 really you know, uh, taking advantage of all these technologies and and, and the the ability to build large scale search systems, uh, uh, you know, that is relatively new to the market. So, Beth, I wonder if I could s sort of start this line of questioning around business problems with you. So it seems because you're in the marketing space, it seems like brands are scrambling to try to understand new demand patterns and customer preferences. As consumers, we all have, we have so much information now about pricing, about product, what's good, what's not good. And it seems like brands have to find a way to capture information that they didn't have before to gain both competitive advantage, learn more about the consumers, oftentimes learning more about the consumers than the consumer knows about himself or herself. 
Is that fair to say that that's a big part of what the problem is that you guys are helping customers solve? Talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so for, part of the problem actually is the industry is changing almost every month. There's something new coming along, some new threat, some new idea that someone has. And so we're having to adapt our algorithms all the time. And so that's partly why, again, why we're transitioning to Spark, because it's providing the flexibility that we didn't have before. We have a whole library of machine learning libraries that are available to us through Spark that we don't have to write everything from scratch every time. Okay, and then, and then Tamara, let me start with you. Uh, and, and Danny, you guys are probably solving similar problems, maybe with a different, different angle, but, but the problem you're solving is this big, chewy problem of, of security. Uh, what's the big data angle on that? But So talk about the problem, your unique approach uh, to solving it. Sure, yeah, so um, you know, any crime worth doing online is better off being done by a million machines or 10 million machines rather than an individual actor. So um, there's all these, these use cases um, and what we found is, um, especially in advertising, uh, it, it fuels a billion dollar black market of malware. So um, all that spam that you see, all that phishing to infect your computer, there's a variety of use cases they can do with your computer once it's infected. Um, anything from denial of service attacks, um, uh, stealing credentials, keystroke logging, things like that, or wide scale ad fraud, uh, which is a, a, a lot of easy money. Um, one of the few uh, recurring revenue models for cybercrime. Uh, usually you're one and done, but this is one where you generate a lot. So um, uh, our, our goal is to detect all forms of that. Anytime that you have that kind of money involved in a cyber crime, you have real adaptation. So you're talking about some of the world's best hackers that are making millions to tens of millions or even organized groups that are making tens to hundreds of millions of dollars um, adapting to get around uh, detection mechanisms and, and whatnot. So, um, what we've developed a, a method uh, that's evidence-based where we essentially look at uh, a variety of technical measurements and performance of the browser, um, and we fingerprinted uh, signals of automation and remote control. So every time a page loads with our line of JavaScript or something else in it, uh, we collect anywhere from 500 data points to 2,000 data points. Uh, some of it is structured, some of it's very unstructured, and that's where the challenges of arbitrarily large data comes into play. You have 2,000 data points of nested data structures, and uh, you know anyone who's worked in the web knows that it's a wild west of data, uh, wh what you get from browsers and devices. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult problem uh, when it gets uh, at that scale. Um, and we see anywhere from 10 to uh, uh, 15 billion events a day on the web, web transactions, um, about 20 terabytes of data a day in, in some cases, depending on the, the, the volume that day and uh, obviously petabytes a year. So uh, being able to analyze that in real time and deliver results, we have an analytics platform that's uh, up to date within two to three minutes of seeing an event um, for, for just monitoring. We have another prevention product that's that's uh, five to 10 milliseconds in, in responding to an event. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so it, it brings those challenges with it. So, and, and Danny, when, you, when we talk to uh, practitioners in our community, uh, they tell us, well, we used to spend all our money on, we dig the moat around the castle, try to protect the queen, but these days the queen's <laughs> leaving the castle, data's flying all over the place. I mean, Hadoop was all about bringing you know, the code to data. Um, so. I'm presuming you're seeing that, that trend obviously changing in the way in which people secure their, their data and information. How does that affect what you guys are doing in, in, in the way in which you use analytics to solve no, the problem? This, this is a great question and actually it sort of underlies our whole philosophy as a company. We founded the company really from this, this premise that you know, defense, while still necessary, is no longer sufficient. That you can build all the moat you want um, but given the sophistication of, of threats these days and, and the, the just myriad ways that, that data can actually leave an organization, you have to assume that data will get out. And so we, we, we decided early on to very much take this kind of big data approach to this problem and, and actually you know, use this large scale computing capability to go outside the organization and look proactively beyond the, the network borders for these signatures and to say that if you can if you can 
if you can catch it first before anyone else, if you can see your data out there before others can see it, you can mitigate a lot of the damage um, that, that would typically occur when, when these data breaches are being discovered by third parties, by uh, you know, often the public at the same time the company affected is discovering it. And so by bringing that breach discovery into the organization and, and, and really focusing, again, this idea of, of streaming in real time nature, if we, can, if, we, if we can bring the discovery time down from the average, you know, used to be on the order of hundreds of days down to minutes even, then you can really you can really provide a lot of value, and so these technologies are really what underpin that that capability. George, I wonder if you could sort of kick off the discussion around. Um, you just gave a presentation. You showed your forecast on, you know, big data 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. You took us through the journey. You and I have talked a lot about uh, those that have Hadoop expertise built up can, you know, maybe bring in things like Spark and evolve their Hadoop. You know, infrastructure. Others may start from scratch. What are you seeing there? And maybe get a discussion going around what these individuals specifically are doing at their companies. It was, it was interesting to hear starting points. If I recall, um, Beth, you started with Hadoop, Hadoop. on Qbol, and Tamir, you were uh, you, well. You were on Databricks, so you were always uh, Spark. Um, we, were, uh, we were we were on Hadoop. We're actually just getting started with Databricks oh, and okay. migrating into that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and Danny, so if you were on MapR, you're probably traditional Hadoop based. I guess the big question I would have is, from the time you get your hands for each of you on data, to the time you get an answer. What is that time frame, that latency, and how has that changed as your platform has evolved? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and that's obviously one of the drivers in adopting new technologies in the database world like this. Um, but, uh, I mean, for us, you know, if it, if, if it was anything that spanned multiple days, and um, uh, originally, even early days, you would have to write a Hadoop query or code, so, so there was time there, and there was a queue there and then that had to run, and sometimes... Oh, you it, mean for each new job, you had to write a query? Like, it wasn't like a repeatable... Uh, in some cases, yeah, it, it depends on the complexity of the query. Um, uh, in early days, yeah, it would be Hadoop for us. We, we moved to some SQL on big data solutions that allowed at least that part to become a little bit more decentralized and less of a queue, but uh, it, it still... Um, you know, if, you, if you're spanning multiple days, it could take several hours or even overnight to run a basic query uh, to get intel. Um, okay, and how did that, how did that, do you, do you have any estimates now that you're going to be on Databricks, how much faster that would be? It's, it's still early days for us, and uh, that's the first use case we're tackling. Uh, so so we're, we're just starting to build our uh, Parquet data warehouse internally and running test cases. It looks rather fast, but but uh, the, the jury is still out. Order of magnitude, uh, 2x, um, 20x? Yeah, depending on the type of query, I would say one to five x. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, when you get into that type of, uh, that world, it depends whether the data is structured, it's unstructured, you have nested queries, do you have a, a strongly typed schema? So, so all those use cases play. Here. Okay. Yeah. When Beth, what, yep. what about you? That the sort of the the elapsed time from question to answer and how that's changed. So for question to answer, that's probably going to be a little bit faster with Spark, but that's that's not the really big win. The really big win is the time from prototype to production, because in the old days we'd have to the, the data science team prototype probably in Python. You know, I don't know, a mixed bag of things. And then eventually that has to be written up in Java and run on Hadoop. That's a pretty big undertaking. Uh -huh. But with Spark, you, go, you can work, okay, you might work in Python in Spark and maybe in Scala in production, but the actual libraries and everything are the same, the calls are the same. So the time to production is going to be a lot faster. So that's a big win for us because our customers are definitely demanding more flexibility. Can you quantify that change? In Again, early uh, days for okay. us. Um, it's probably uh, maybe months to weeks sort of thing, that sort okay. of change, that would be huge. That is huge. 
it's funny because we're um, have a similar experience with the idea of you know one of the attractive things about Spark is the the Python integration. We we're a big Python shop and and really believers in. in in that approach, at the same time, for us, the real-time nature of our system is one of its big value points. So, you know, response times in the in the days or months are scary-sounding things for us. For us, we go for minutes. So, you know, we're we're shooting for sub-15 minutes is when we or we want you know between some event happening and our customers knowing about it. That, that real-time nature is is a key value of our product. But how did you get to such a low latency on a Hadoop-based solution? Well, our computations are relatively straightforward. We're simply trying to kind of match um, our data fingerprints under monitoring for our clients to the things that we're collecting, and that is a pretty straightforward computation, I think, compared to a lot of the other compu computational things that people are doing with, with, with these technologies. So our, uh, we, we focus a lot more on, on speed and, and, and simplicity uh, rather than trying to kind of Achieve some really, you know, really deep computational milestones. So that really helps speed things up. Okay. How did how did you all um, evaluate the trade-offs between sort of evolving, you know, bringing Spark into your Hadoop ecosystem versus sort of putting in a separate infrastructure like Databricks or maybe using uh, uh, some other stack like you know, Kafka or Cassandra or Mesos? How, how did you sort of think about those those trade-offs? Maybe Danny, you could. Um, sure. So, I mean, for starters, we're we're big fans of the the Mapr Hadoop distribution. I mean, part, partly because it's you know it is it is natively implemented and incredibly fast, and that's really again comes down to to our our particular product characteristics. Speed is you know speed is important, and, and time is is one of the, the key differentiators. Um, the other uh, you know the, the, the Spark attraction is really. You know, the, again, the, the Python integration, the simplicity of integrating with the rest of our analytics and, and our, um, our, uh, you know, the rest of our stack, and so having that, you know, that really beautiful kind of um, computational ability, so, so simply wrapped up in in something that the rest that we that we use every day, and not having to do that translation, um, is a really attractive thing for us. In fact, you're kind of going through that process of evaluation now, or? We are. Uh, well, we've been in HDFS and S3 for a while now, so for us it's natural to stay there and just put Spark on top of that. Now in the future though, we may move to some of the other technologies if it makes sense. But we, we're still in a transition phase, so let's change one thing at a time. So for now we're changing from Hadoop to Spark, but we're keeping the file structures the same. Okay, and, and Tamar, am I correct that you guys sort of came into Spark you know, more aggressively, you know, via Databricks? Did we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, we already had the infrastructure and in, uh, Kafka, Cassandra, that type of thing. So we started off with Spark early independently, just trying it out in small components of the data pipeline, really just as an exercise to get familiar and, and see what the capabilities are. Um, where, where Databricks uh, came in, uh, it was more about starting to move into broader use cases. One of our bigger ones is ad hoc data exploration of large and unstructured data sets. It's a challenging problem. Um, and you know, data accessibility is a real thing. Um, the, every, what we're trying to optimize in engineering uh, departments is, is velocity, right? Velocity of delivering this or migrating to this. And when you're talking about wide scale shifting over to different frameworks, that's where you start to hit bottlenecks. So um, the more you can build up tooling and, and minimize that, that transition, that, the pain of that transition, it, it's important. Um, D Databricks uh, actually just fits well for the full end of the spectrum. Spark does in general, but we're talking like I can just give somebody access to Spark, let them explore and play, that eventually turns into a prototype that eventually can go into production, and that can be, as Beth said, in a variety of languages, whether it's Python or R, um, which is very powerful. Uh, in a, in so in thinking about, you're just sort of describing this sort of agile world, this DevOps world, you didn't use that term, but different from, okay, I got a, an IT project, it's got a beginning and an end, I got a project plan, I got to fund it, I got to get a team together. Um, how do you know when you're done? Uh, do you approach it on a project by project basis? Is it a weekly sprint? Do you have a sort of a, a goal post that you're trying to get to? How do you manage your organization? 
Sure, yeah, uh, that's a great question. It, uh, it varies widely from organization to organization, right? So our, our, at White Ops, we have a, a defined set of stages um, of, of research, which is optional, code and deploy and delivery. And we, um, we tend to break everything up, um, these projects we call epics, into milestones. So we will have very defined milestones of, this is what it looks like at the end of this milestone. And um, so sometimes it'll be open research and, and that's when you don't know what the milestones should look like. So you put a research spike on it for two weeks or for a sprint. And then we say, well, at the end of this, we should be able to um, run these 10 common queries and get this kind of performance back and the, you know have this, this schema of a warehouse you know, uh, kind of use case and uh, we can define that and then you're in a race to do it. And, and uh, okay, point. so you got that checklist, and, yeah. and Beth, you got a platform. Everything, yep. every project I presume goes into that platform. Yes, <laughs> uh, we have. I mean, as a company as a whole, of course, we have a roadmap out several years, and then the roadmap gets more and more detailed the closer in you get. So, of course, we have a roadmap for this quarter, and my team has a roadmap. So, and that has deliverables and milestones and stretch goals and all the rest of it. And then we have planning in every few weeks to see how well we can do against those goals. And, and Dan, anything you'd add to that? Um, I mean, I, the only thing I would say is that for us is a little bit different because uh, the technology is actually core to our product. Uh, and it's being used, you know, it's part of the everyday operation of the system. And so um, it, it's a little bit of a different question. I mean, we. We're done when the product works, and so. But at the same time, it's always a you know, an improvement process. So it's it's a little bit that less project based and more a core foundation stone of the architecture of the the whole offering. So. Is it fair to say that each of you are, are relatively early adopters of sort of big data, Hadoop, you know, analytics, you know, leading edge sort of uh, uh, practices? Is that is that fair to say or? Yeah, okay. I, I, it's an interesting question. I would say yes, it, but it's been a long early adopter phase, right? <laughs> and, uh, it, it's not. It's it's a challenging space uh, with challenging problems that's slowly becoming um, more and more solved. Um, so the reason I ask is that l last time we did a little exploration within our community of you, know, you sit down privately with people and you can dig, find out what they're really getting out of their investments, and it, it came out that every dollar people were spending, on average, that people were spending on big data, you know, modern big data, they were getting 50 cent return, not too good. Um, long journey, so maybe early days that was like that. Uh, you guys maybe had a, a different experience, I don't know, but, so what was your return, what's your return, what, you know, generically speaking, high level, on the whole big data initiative, obviously you're building a company around it, so that's kind of a dumb question, but how about that question on Spark? Are you getting return on your Spark investments today? And when, if not, when do you expect to get them? Maybe you could talk about the ROI a little bit. It, Go ahead, Beth. It's very early days yeah. for us. Uh, we know that if we can cut the time from prototype to production, that would be a huge win for us. Um, we also expect there will be major speed ups and other cost savings turning to Spark. Even lines of code saved will be a huge return on investment for us. So it's speed and, and cost? Robustness, all okay. those things. And, and have, Danny, have you, are you, do you have visibility on? I mean, I, I guess I could speak generally that, kind of as you said, we built our whole company around the existence of these technologies. And I, would, I always say, you know, five years ago, we couldn't have made the product that we made. Um, I also find myself saying, you know, what a time to be alive a lot, uh, just because the, the, the scale at which you can, you can deal with these large data sets and the efficiency has just been... You know, it's, it's, if you step back, it's kind of mind-blowing given, you know, when I was in school and building, you know, Beowulf clusters and, you know, even things like basic cluster management, you had to write from scratch. And so, uh, I guess I'm sounding kind of like an, an old man here, but, um, but like I said, it's just the, the, the pace at which you're able to kind of deal with larger and larger scales of information is just, is, it's really exciting. And, and Tamar, your Spark experience, I mean? Yeah, you know, um, the, the, the value spans so many um, faucets of the system, right? It's not just about performance, as Beth said. You know, I, the, um, uh, when you get into velocity and delivery, right? I, the, the fact that I can onboard an engineer and they can write Python, my, my PhD data scientists can write R, um, some of my forward-thinking engineers can dive right into Scala, right? And they, 
uh, or SQL to explore data. They can do all this in exploration. Um, and like I said, that can evolve into prototypes. It's, it's a very powerful thing. It, and at WhiteOps, we have pretty diverse teams, um, one of them being what we call the detection team, right? They're, they're white hat hackers, and some of them are legitimately you know, hackers, not scale engineers. Um, in fact, that they can write in Python and SQL, um, and my, my data science team, my data intelligence team can go into R and, and Java and things like that. It's pretty powerful. And, um, you know, I, the, the moment my PhDs start becoming scale data engineers, that's, you know, you, you start building a unicorn, right? And, um, and unicorns aren't found, they're made. And, uh, and so this, that kind of enablement is, um, is, is of tremendous value. Okay. Um, question on sort of out of scope expectations. Just thinking about your, your, little, your journey here. Um, things that were unexpected, obstacles that you hit, out of scope expectations. Um, you know, if you had to do it over again, sort of question, what would you do differently? I mean, you know, you hear a lot of, well, we get executive buy in, business alignment, but, but what else, Beth? Maybe you could start us off. You mean technical obstacles? Hmm, you choose. Okay, um, so our, even though we build our models in a batch mode, they actually have to run in real time on a decisioning system that makes 1.6 million decisions per second. So there's sort of memory constraints and time constraints. And one thing we found is that we were hoping to just use the Spark models, but it, you couldn't just bring all the Spark context into that. So we had to write some extra code to deal with that transformation. And talking to some other people at the conference, actually, we found that other people had this problem too. So we weren't the only ones that had to solve that. But it's working now, so it's great. Danny? <laughs> I mean, I think the only thing that we, we discovered as we started using all of, all of these technologies more and more is just, I think it actually is pretty early days. We talked about being early adopters. I think all these technologies are still new and they still have that sort of, for lack of a better phrase, that new technology smell to them. You know, uh, you know, things aren't necessarily documented perfectly. I mean, this is a, this is not any one specific, you know, vendor or, or you know group is is implicated. It's just sort of the 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 result of this stuff being relatively new, and um, and so, you know, I would just say that it, we we found that it was the, the things were not as mature as we had as we had expected, but, but then again, we kind of expected to find that. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's only going to get better um, and only going to become more mature and kind of more seamless mm -hmm. as, we, as we deal with this stuff. Okay. All right, last question. Each of you, describe you know, your nirvana. Five years down the road, what's, what's nirvana look like to you, Tamra? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, five to 10 years ago, a unified data platform wasn't even a part of the conversation, right? The, the, the classic case where you'll ETL 10 systems into a warehouse overnight and have jobs that could fail and have de dependencies, maybe you know a variety of different data stores. Um, but I think just in the past few years, it's become possible to have almost a fully unified data platform where um, all, all the layers are on top of each other. You're not duplicating data. Um, and all of those problems that come with the ETL of several components or data sources or data supporting databases are only magnified as big data scales larger and larger. So um, it, it'll become more, more important. So yeah, my dream that some people still laugh at is that I don't need seven databases, I don't even need three. Um, uh, granted, you still need the right tool for the job. Uh, but I believe we're much closer to a unified data platform than we were right. several, several years ago. All right, George, what's your nirvana? <laughs> well, being that, that our panelists are, are all rooted heavily in the real world, and uh, I would look at sort of the, the um, usage scenarios that our, our CUBE guests were all trying to achieve today where it's combining the, the rich historical information we've got at the data lake um, with the uh, really low latency um, information streaming in that we want to integrate with our systems of record. So we have um, fresh freshness and context to make better decisions um, at a high level that I think can apply to a lot of applications. Great, all right Beth. 
Um, so for our system, many of our customers are big brands and they have their own data science teams who are pretty smart and they know what they're doing. My nirvana would be that they could actually bring their own algorithms to the table and they write them themselves, bring their own data, bring whatever they need, it comes in and it just works in our system. And my, my team can still provide their own algorithms, but you know, we can have all algorithms available great. to run. How about you, Danny? Um, I guess I would say you know, there's a lot of talk about how these technologies sort of scale limitlessly, but when you actually try to scale them to the limits, you find there are still limits, and I think that you know, someday we really will, I mean, if you're talking about Nirvana, other than generally kind of always being amazed at what a, what a neat time it is to be doing this stuff, um, I think you know, the ultimate goal is when there really is limitless scaling, when you, when you don't ever hit those limits and you just keep going. I mean, I don't know if you ever get there. I mean, every, you know, every time you take the technology from the whiteboard to the real world, there's always going to be limits. But, but when you can finally say, okay, this really can hold and handle whatever you throw at it, and we really mean that, um, I think that, that'll be kind of a, a good mark of, of maturity. Awesome. My nirvana, for what it's worth, is we've been building these communities for five or six years, and I really hope that we can continue to leverage those communities to create information to help doers like yourselves and, and others and peers you know, get stuff done and, and apply technology to solve business problems, create business capabilities. So thank you all so much for coming on theCUBE and, and sharing your insights. All right, keep it right there, everybody. This is day one at Spark Summit East. We'll be back with a full day of coverage tomorrow. This is theCUBE, we're live from Manhattan. See you tomorrow. <laughs>